What's up, YouTube? Abstractions are one of the most fundamental elements and the most important tenant of software design. Yet, most of us don't know what they are. Most of us can't explain to anyone what abstractions really are. And most of us can't discern good from bad abstractions. So here we are in a field where, as I said, abstractions are a key tenet of software design, yet we can't teach it. Some people have tried. Uh, I've certainly tried myself as well. Most people can't explain it. I've tried myself. I'll, and you'll see my effort in this video. So I'm hoping to do a good job of trying to explain to you abstractions. So I'm going to start with what they are. I'm not going to go through major definitions, but just to understand at a high level what an abstraction really is or intended to be. And then through the course of this video, I'm going to show you different examples, code examples, and give my explanation of the reasoning for why something is a good or bad abstraction or why a certain abstraction is the way it is in terms of the code that you see. With the hope that this exercise or this video is going to help you discern good from bad abstractions or leaky abstractions or good abstractions and or too much or too little abstraction. These are all the flaws or problems I see with people creating or defining their own abstractions. As important as abstractions are, and as helpful or useful as a good abstraction is, what's better than a bad abstraction? What's better than a bad abstraction is no abstraction. In other words, what I'm saying is, if you're not sure about your abstraction or the level of abstraction or whether it's a good or bad abstraction or whether it's a leaky abstraction, just don't try it. Maybe this is not the time to do the abstraction and which has actually been most often the case. I find people are rushing to make an abstraction, yet they don't really have a good grasp of what is it that they are trying to do and what that abstraction needs to look like. It's too early in the design phase or too early in the implementation phase where you're attempting an abstraction and you're going to miss the mark. You're going to make a bad abstraction and that is going to be worse than not having one in the first place. I'll try and explain that to you during the course of the video as to how or when you should be going down the path of creating an abstraction. But I'm also going to be giving you a basis or a foundational understanding, I hope, <laughs> of looking at how or when or why you should be creating an abstraction in the first place and then kind of going down a certain path and missing all the bad, if you will, you know, because you have certain ideas in mind. Now I'm going to try and impart to you certain I won't call them guidelines or, or rules or whatever, but just, just call them guiding principles of how to design an abstraction. And therefore, if you do that well enough, you could still get a bad abstraction, but I'm hoping that'll help you that. All right, so let's get started with the uh, definition, simple, simplified or simple definition of an abstraction. I think Edgar Dijkstra, I'm hoping I'm saying that correctly, Edgar Dijkstra, I think some of the, the Danish would say that. I think he's Dutch said, the purpose of an abstraction is not to be vague. And he must have said that because he's really ex experienced many people trying to make an abstraction that goes really vague. And I see the same thing. Till date, that's the problem. These vague abstractions, we'll talk about that. So the purpose of an abstraction is not to be vague, but rather to provide a simplified meaning of something to be more precise. That is saying a lot if you understand abstractions, if you or you can discern good from bad abstractions or too much or too little abstractions. What he's saying is get to the right level of abstraction. Not too much, but also not too little. And definitely not vague. A vague abstraction is trying to be more generic. And this is the biggest problem I see with abstractions. People are trying to make this one wonderful abstraction that can do pretty much anything they want to do today and in the future and for the whole you know, software programming community. Don't bother. Please don't try that. That is too vague an abstraction. It doesn't help. All right? It's okay for some libraries, and we'll discuss some of that, where for libraries, you want to be less precise because the library is trying to give you more options. But when you're building an application and you are designing your own abstraction, you are not, hopefully, <laughs> not trying to be vague. You're trying to be precise. Not too precise, but <laughs> the right amount of precise. So let's try and understand the level of abstraction and what that means. Too much abstraction and too little abstraction. Right? There are also other terms, weak and, weak and strong abstraction or uh, good and bad abstractions. 
they get unnecessarily confusing. But I think too much too little, little might need an explanation so that as I move forward to this video, I'm using them in the right manner so that you can understand what they mean, right? So there's a spectrum of abstraction. Can you see my hands here? So that's too little, at least from my perspective. Yeah, speaking from your perspective, actually. <laughs> too little abstraction and too much abstraction. So what's the right level of abstraction then? In the middle? No. <laughs> well, let's first define what is too much or what is too little. Imagine you're doing something with some, some class or some, let's say the file system. If you create too much of an abstraction, you're almost not even sure what it is you're doing exactly. Right? It's becoming vague and vague. The, 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 too much of an abstraction is becoming vaguer and vaguer, if there's such a term, vaguer. It's, it's becoming too obtuse, it's becoming too generalized, too generic. Too little abstraction is keeping you so close to the actual implementation of what's going on behind the scenes that you're not getting much of an abstraction, right? So that's too little. Too much is kind of on the vague side. So as Dijkstra said, you know, the, the purpose of an abstraction is not to be vague, to be more precise. Which also means not exposing or hiding enough of the complexities, which is what a, the purpose of an abstraction is, is to hide the complexity of a certain thing or certain, you know, implementation while giving you an interface, if you will, a public surface that is more useful, hiding the complexities and yet keeping the interface useful. That usefulness is that is that usefulness at the right level of abstraction? Is it too little, as in you're still exposed to some of the inners and the inner workings of what that complexity is, and thus it's kind of a leaky abstraction? Or is it too much, meaning it's so vague you have no idea what it is you're doing? For example, you know, if I'm trying to build an abstraction for a database, I could use terms like database or data store or storage. The, you follow that the name is becoming more and more vague, storage. What could it be? Now, you, you, maybe your intention is to be vague, in the sense that in this particular applica uh, application, you're, for some reason, valid reason, <laughs> trying to hide the fact that the data comes from a database. Maybe it could come from an in-memory store or a, a cache or blob storage or something. And so the reason for why you're being vague in the naming is because you're intending, not because of a future possibility, but you know now. That's the problem with abstractions are fine. They become vague because people are imagining all kinds of future possibilities. And that generalization, the vagueness, becomes, you pay a cost for that. You pay a very heavy cost in the sense of people trying to comprehend and understand your system. You, as a person that designed the system, might know and understand it, but others are ha having a hard time getting to grips with that vague abstraction. Unless that's the requirement. See, so if anyone understands that yes, we are working with the database, but we also could be working with uh, in-memory cache. We could also be working with Azure blob storage or something. It's a well-known and understood thing in the application or in the team that we need that level of abstraction where we are being vague about our storage. We just call it storage. We don't call it data store or database, some abstraction, right? If that's needed. So at that point, you're getting more of the strong side of abstraction, but yet if it's useful, it's useful if, the application I see requires it now. I can see the need now. I'm not imagining a future need, right? Too little of an abstraction will not allow you to, in this particular case, allow you to be able to implement different implementations, ones that go against the cache versus ones that go against the database versus ones that go against like the Azure Blob Storage to apply or do the same thing, right? So, too little also becomes sort of leaky. I and mean, I'll explain what leaky abstractions are. There's many ways to look at leaky. I'm going to describe probably one aspect of a leaky abstraction because I think that's the one that is the most common one that people find. I, I find when I look at people's abstractions, they're not clean abstractions. Right? They have something, some issue with them. So the, a good abstraction, at least in, from an object-oriented design perspective, a good abstraction is choosing the right level, meaning too little to too much. Right, level of abstraction, retaining the detail required from a domain point of view. In other words, you are building an abstraction for the purposes of your domain, for whatever application you're building, whether it's a game or a business system, whatever that domain is. It's specific to the domain, and of course in this particular case, particular case also specific to the application you're building, and for the need of that abstraction with regard to your domain. For example, I'm, and I'm going to show you an example of that here by, in code, I need to use a message broker. Message brokers allow you to publish 
to messages to certain topics or exchanges and allow you to subscribe to certain queues or subscriptions, depending on what uh, message broker you're using. At a high level, they perform these two functions. But within a system that is in this pub sub, publish sub, subscribe architecture, there are many applications within the many microservices, if you want to call them that, that only publish, they don't subscribe. There are others that only subscribe, don't publish. And there are some who publish and subscribe. So for the one application that only needs to publish, does it need an abstraction that talks about subscription? No, of course not. And conversely, if the, for the one app or the bunch of applications that need to only subscribe but not publish, do they need to know about publish? No. So the right level of abstraction for the applications that are doing the publishing is the fact that they don't have to know about or get muddled with subscriptions. And conversely, on the other side, those applications that do the publishing but don't do the subscription shouldn't have to know about the subscription. Sorry, do the subscription but don't do the publishing, don't know about the publishing but just know about the subscription. Right? So it's picking the right level of abstraction. Not too much, not too little. <laughs> It's certainly not in the middle, right? Which might be an easy way to say it's always in the middle. No, it's not. It's, it depends on where you're trying to get at. So I'm saying in the case of the publisher only application, you're going more towards the stronger abstraction, this the right level. For the application that requires both publish and subscribe, you're literally like in the middle somewhere because you're weakening the abstraction in the sense that you're saying it's publish and subscribe. And if you look at each of those, they may be at the same level. I mean, the publishing functionality might be the same level as the application that does only the publishing, which again, I'll show you in this uh, code here. So I don't want to get you too muddled with me just talking, right? So we've, at a high level, I've given you kind of the description of what an abstraction is. And I've tried to explain that there are things like good and bad abstractions or too much or too little abstractions. And also from the perspective of object and programming, picking that right level abstraction, exposing the right amount of detail and it's domain specific. And these are the key aspects moving forward. I think keeping in mind that you are building this application for this specific domain, for your specific needs, don't try and generalize for the whole software community or your whole organization. Abstractions should be specific to the application. Don't start too early in this idea of building an abstraction. People I find jump too quickly into abstractions, especially uh, methods. Methods and abstractions too, are they not? You are saying, here's a method, give me some information, I'll do all the stuff for you. You don't need to know how to do it. Same idea. You're providing a level of abstraction by way of your method signature, hiding all the complexity of the implementations, and thus methods are your first kind of abstraction that you would be building in software. Right? Classes are the next level. But if you remember my few of the talks, API design principles, method design principles, they all talk about the same thing. If you can design methods correctly, you can design classes correctly for the same exact reason. If you can decide the proper level of abstraction at the method level, then your classes will be at the right level too, right? From a method standpoint, I've seen people are rushing to make a generalized or generic method. Like they make one and while they're making the one, they're imagining other uses for that one. And so they start to add additional parameters to make it parameterized, the method to make it more generalized. Don't do that. Even if you copy paste that method two to three times, it's fine. I have a rule of thirds and sometimes it goes to rule of fourths, which is if you copy paste it for the third time, that's the time to sit back and think about, okay, now that I've used this, I've copy pasted the method three times, what should I do now to refactor it, to make it more abstract, right? more generalized. But it may not, three may not be enough. And if you, the way you implement the uh, abstraction or generalization is by adding more arguments, especially bowls. Bowl method arguments are not allowed in my, my systems. It's, it's, it's indicative of this problem, that you are trying to generalize a method and you're adding bowl arguments, and sometimes more than one, <laughs> And this is all this conditional logic in this one method that's trying to be generalized. It's, it's faking the generalization, if that makes sense to you. You are implementing a method with lots of if-else conditions to give the impression to the outside that your method is generalized. I don't like those kinds of abstractions. I like cleaner abstractions where it, the method signature is not changing because of the fact that you are having to do different implementations. And 
as a result, I certainly not bull. I mean, there could be maybe like an enum or something, which is a little more useful, but even that will be suspect. Polymorphism is sort of the best you know, use case as I can find, where the abstract method in the base class is the signature and all descendants have exactly the same signature, but their implementations are different as a result of which you're getting different behaviors. So you're effectively able to reuse that one method to effect different behavior. And that sometimes becomes the solution for method abstractions, right? If you jump to make a method more generalized, you're fixing your future possibility. You've kind of killed your future possibility of moving anywhere else besides making a method. And then keep adding on more and more capability to that method as you realize more and more use cases that need to be satisfied by your generalization. Make sense? So rather than jump rush to generalize on method signatures and implement these gener generic or generalized reusable methods, I'm saying wait. Keep in mind that, remember that you have the duplication, the copy pasting with little tweaks. Remember that, I'm not saying forget that but revisit it later. After you've sometimes implemented this entire system and you have a much, much better understanding of what it is you're doing. What, does, what do all these methods have to do? What are the commonalities and what are the variances? And apply a decision, design decision, after all that understanding, your abstraction will be far cleaner, far more useful because you have the full gamut of possibilities, variances, right? the commonality and the variances. So when you make a choice, should I make it a method? Should I use polymorphism? Should I use delegates? There are so many options. Why fix yourself early in the implementation phase without knowing the full depth and breadth of the re all the requirements that that one method might have to have, like the variances? So I think with method design, that's all I'm going to say because a lot of it will play out in class design as well. So I'm just, I want to just show you now class design. So what is the basic? I'm going to show you some examples, though, quite a few of them. But I'm going to talk about some basic ideas first with regards to class design and abstractions with regards to classes. There are, at high level, there are two purposes to abstractions when it comes to classes. Ideally, they're doing the same thing, which is they're trying to hide the complexity yet surface the right level of detail, domain-specific detail that applies to your domain your application, your, the domain of your application. What are they hiding exactly? What is this complexity? Could be many things. Sometimes the complexity is the fact that you might be coupled to something like a database or a, you know, a library that's giving you access to, let's say, Azure, you know, uh, Cosmos DB, uh, you know, or a database for ADU.net versus Oracle and others. Sometimes you are creating an abstraction to give yourselves the ability to use different implementations, polymorphism. And uh, in fact, the D in solid dependency in version is a big example of this. In fact, just, you know, the, I was planning to make a video on dependency in version because I think that's one of the important aspects. It's not applied again you know, from the get-go, so just be aware. That's kind of the point of this talk. Don't rush into the abstraction mode right away. But it's a good idea. Dependency inversion is a very clean and you know, useful concept, but the problem is it depends on abstractions. So here I am talking to you about abstractions because if I can't explain abstractions to you, then you're certainly not going to understand dependency inversion. But the idea is that you are building an abstraction such that you can have multiple implementations, I'll show you examples of those, without impacting or without your application knowing that there are different abstractions, different implementations, which right? is what polymorphism is. Okay. So hiding some complexity, decoupling yourself from some third-party library, which is the another reason you might have an abstraction, which I do quite a bit, and for a good reason, and I'll explain that those reasons, and then polymorphism, which is having a single or unified interface, if you will, the abstraction, while having multiple implementations, allowing your application to use one or the other implementation as long as your abstraction is at the right, right level of abstraction for that application and is domain specific, right? Okay, so let's look at some examples. This code you're seeing here is, I'll put a link to it in the description below, is part of my um, message broker series where I introduced the adapter pattern. This code is the adapter pattern, so if you've seen that, great. If you haven't, you might want to look at that, that video. I'll put a link to it here. 
that video goes more about discussing the the pattern itself uh, while here I'm using the code to explain abstraction All right. so here is a message broker publisher base this is the base class for all message broker publishers then on the right left hand side here we have one implementation which is a message broker publisher for service bus right that's my naming convention. I'll use the same prefix if you will in the first part, while the suffix will be base or the specific implementation. In this case, the is service bus, right? And that descends from the, the base class. So this is the abstraction here, the base class. That's the abstraction. Now you I'm hoping, and you're probably thinking about this, like so okay, so how do I get to this abstraction? How do I know this is what I need? The method signatures to be, especially the public aspect, the public surface, right? Here's the thing you need to understand. I have an abstraction. It may not be so obvious in the message publisher side, but in the message subscriber side, you're gonna it's gonna blow your mind and think, holy crap, I don't think I would have come up with that abstraction. What I'm getting at is I didn't just come up with this abstraction the first time I started using message brokers. I've used in this case both RabbitMQ and Service Bus for many, many years, for many, many projects. I'm very, very familiar with both these message brokers. I am confident I can make a good abstraction today after having used those classes, those um, services, and their libraries. See, RabbitMQ has its own library, and Source Bus has its own library. We'll talk about that now. But I'm familiar with the libraries. I'm familiar with the message brokers. There are the nuances across the two message brokers. I'm in a good place to design an abstraction for an application that requires both of them in the same system with the possibility of moving to one or the other, right? So don't rush to make an abstraction because you will likely make a bad one. Okay, and remember the, right in the beginning I said, what's worse than not having an abstraction? A bad abstraction. It is a whole lot worse than no abstraction at all, right? A good abstraction is useful, but a bad abstraction is very costly. It's, the team hates using it. It causes a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. It's just not worth the time and trouble. There's another thing I heard from Sandy Metz, I think her name is, and she says something like, the best way forward with a bad abstraction is to go back, <laughs> meaning undo, right? I have the same mentality. Most of the time, some people who work with me will, really, will know I say this. I don't want the problem. I'm not trying to solve it. I don't want the problem, which basically I'm saying backtrack. Go back till you didn't have to go down this path in the first place. Right? Find out, go back till you come to the point where you realize you made the wrong turn and then again go back on the right track right so instead of trying to solve the problem here because you've already gone our way off course and you're trying to solve the problem here i'm saying no back up because you may not even need to go down this route man maybe this is the, the better way to do it and so i think i think she's saying the same thing she's saying the best way forward is to go backwards or something to that effect and that's pretty important as well the the, the saying okay so let's look at now the the subscriber version of the base class and I'll, you'll see that implementation. I'm going to go deeper into the libraries, the RabbitMQ libraries versus the source bus libraries, but also the reasoning for that abstraction. So here is the subscriber base class. Now you can see that the subscribe method, we're only interested in the public methods really. So and this is an abstract base class descending from oh this is a base class sorry. It has the signature of type action that takes a message received event hours and received callback. And already there is a bit of a disconnect here because you're saying, oh, how could you have possibly arrived at that? I mean, that doesn't even make sense, right? And it doesn't. That's what I'm trying to get to. You cannot just design a good abstraction out of thin air. You have to have had the right amount of experiences with the, you know, the two or three variances to understand how best to give an abstraction or create or design the abstraction for that purpose, for that application specifically. Okay? So, However you dice it, you will see that in the implementation for, I'll go back now to the source bus implementation of the subscriber, right? You can see I'm using the subscription client. This is the part of the library from the, from the Azure source bus library, SDK as they call it. This abstraction, the base class that is, this abstraction is hiding 
this notion, knowledge implementation of the class as in the subscription client in this case of Service Bus versus whatever AvidMQ has, a connection factory and connection and so on. Those classes, the library classes, have a lot of methods. I don't want to get muddled. I don't want everyone in the system or everything in the system getting muddled with using that subscription client, the SDK directly in Azure, the Azure Service Bus SDK directly and having to figure out what method to use and it's just too confusing. So one of the purposes of an abstraction is to hide that complexity of the library itself. But by hiding the complexity of the library, you're also decoupling yourself from the library, meaning you're not tightly coupled to Service Bus. You're not tightly coupled to RavenMQ, right? My abstractions would be the same where in a system, some people ask me this, so Shiv, this abstraction is because you need to use RavenMQ and Service Bus in the same application. So you have this abstraction, the, the base classes for the publisher and the subscriber. Would it be different if you needed to use, when you knew you would only ever use Service Bus or you would only ever use RavenMQ? Not really. This abstraction would be the same. Because for me, I'm still focused on what is this thing doing for me in my system, this, the publisher and the subscribers. They're doing a certain kind of work for me. That has not changed. The only thing you're saying is that I have no need to use RabbitMQ, let's say. So do you have a <clears throat> base class and an abstraction? Yes, may not have a base class. I certainly have the abstraction though, meaning it's all implemented in the descendant and that's all I would have. The base class only comes into play if I intend to use polymorphism, you know, in that, in that class, meaning I might have to swap between RabbitMQ and search bus, maybe at runtime or de deployment time, we decide this customer uses, wants to use RabbitMQ, that customer wants to use search bus or whatever the case is. If I don't ha have a need to use a base class in a system, I won't use it. Meaning if I, if you tell me, Shiv, we're the only message broker we will ever use in this, in our application, this and organization is Azure Service Bus, I would use the descendant class minus the base class, meaning of course it'll all be combined one class, but there'll be no notion of a base class and then a descendant. It'll just be the Service Bus class, right? So I said here, the client, the subscription client here, there's a lot of nuances to the client that is being hidden by the implementation, which is the whole point. Lots of methods you have to understand, whereas the public side is just saying subscribe, and right? it just says subscribe. Don't have to worry about all the details. That subscribe means all this stuff for Rabbit for Service Bus. For the Rabbit MQ side, that subscribe means all this, right? And you can also notice here that this message received event args, this is our type. This is the type of the domain, as if you, if you want to say that. It's a class. It's our class. It's not Service Bus's class. It's not RabbitMQ's class. And this is a very key aspect about abstractions. And you've probably heard me say this many, many times when we, I talk about other design patterns, like the gateway design pattern. The gateway works for you. It does not work for the service. What I mean by that is the inputs and outputs of the abstraction of the gateway design work for you. They are your classes. They're not classes related to that service. So the same thing applies here in this message broker thing, probably more and more uh, prominent or obvious in the publisher here. So when I'm publishing a message, I'm, I'm publishing a message. Whose message is this? This is our message, the domain's message. It has nothing to do with RabbitMQ or Service Bus. The implementations would have to map between our message and however Service Bus needs this message and however RabbitMQ needs this message our implementation would have to do the mapping, and I'll show you that. But we are, our abstraction is not talking the language of RabbitMQ or Service Bus. And that's a key aspect of abstractions. Your abstractions have to talk in your language. And that is the right level of abstraction, and certainly it's also going towards not making a leaky abstraction. Meaning, if the Service Bus things start to leak out into your application, meaning by way of a method argument or a return type, if this message were the service bus message, it becomes a leaky abstraction because you're letting the service busness, <laughs> service busness of the implementation leak out of your application. And your application is now being caught up in the service bus things or the RabbitMQ things. Right? So it's a leaky abstraction in that sense. You're letting me in on how what is needed to require to implement. Now you're not doing a clean abstraction because you're forcing me to talk to service bus, even in my application, before I can talk to your abstraction, in this case, this ab abstraction. Right? So if you look at the, the publisher for service bus, you can see that the, it takes the our message, 
and effectively mapping it to in this case a service bus message right i just alias it to sb message and effectively is using this message classes properties to map it to the service bus property and then is calling the topic client which is the sdk client from azure for service bus to send a message using the service bus message so this method is effectively just mapping our message to the service bus message the rabbit mq version of the implementation is doing the same thing is taking our message right the type and it's mapping it to in this case what they call i basic properties which is this type here let me you see that type i basic properties that's the rabbit mq thing nothing to do with us as well at all but it's confined or encapsulated within this class the whole rabbit mq nature of this class is confined within this class where this class is using these two rabbit mq specific things while the service bus thing is using this uh, so it's a specific thing, right? The same idea persists on the publisher, sorry, subscriber side. It's a little more complicated uh, just because of the fact that that method signature had to be designed in a way that it becomes, works for both source, uh, source bus and Rabbit MQ. But the idea is when we receive a message, in this case, it uses a uh, callback, we have to map that message to our message received event hours thing. So here's the callback. It receives this SB message and basically mapping that SB message and a bunch of other information that we need into our message received event args. And then that is being sent out here in the callback. So this callback receives one of those. But this is the same or common for both the RabbitMQ versus the source bus version. In this case, in the RabbitMQ, sorry, RabbitMQ implementation, that's the callback. We receive the, in this case, what they call a model and the EA basically. And that maps to a message which maps to a message received. And we call that back here. Implementations are very different. As I said, a, a good abstraction like this would not be possible because you've used Service Bus once or you've used RabbitMQ once or you've been introduced to them very recently. Good abstractions come from understanding very clearly the variances and the commonality between the one or more things you're trying to blend into one abstraction, right? If you're not trying to blend, like if, if you only wanted to use service bus and that's all you had, but you want to build that abstraction like I do anyways, you know, with uh, hi kind of hiding the SDK, if you will, from my business application, the domain of my application, then that abstraction is specific to what you're trying to do from that application. And I'll explain that by way of a Cosmos DB uh, abstraction that I use in my applications. So you can understand what I'm saying with regards to Cosmos DB or that level of abstraction or that kind of abstraction. Right? So here is a class that is got, has got some of these public methods. Just look at some of the public methods here and look at the signatures, meaning inputs and outputs. And that will give you a sense by just looking at this method and the, the names and the data types, inputs and outputs, as to what this is doing. It looks kind of like a database abstraction, does it not? Create a record, get me this data, get me that data, update this data. And what I'm going to say now is, some people may not understand it, but so I'm going to say it anyway so you understand what, I'm, what the purpose of an abstraction is. Yes, I told you this is working with Cosmos DB, but is it apparent in the signature, in the public surface of the class that this is Cosmos DB? Take a look again. No, you, you don't know if it's Cosmos DB or it's ADU.net or is it uh, you know in a memory store or you're storing stuff to a file system. You don't know, and that's the point of an abstraction. Your abstraction is designed for your domain. It has nothing to do with the implementation. If you can keep your kind of your mind in the right place when you're building an abstraction, you're building an abstraction for you. You get caught up and I'm building a Cosmos DB abstraction. I'm building an abstraction for my database. I'm building an abstraction for RabbitMQ or a message broker, right? That is not it. <laughs> your abstraction is being built for your application. That abstraction works for you. It does not work for the, the other thing. If I'm using a charting application, charting library, and I've used some of those in the past, 
these charting libraries are incredible, are they not? I mean, this like <laughs> they make it so simple for you to create graphs and charts, 3Ds and proper shading and all. It's just fantastic. But they're extremely complex. No? Whenever I've used these charting third party libraries, I essentially build an abstraction. I said, in from my application, I want to create a bar chart. And I have this information. And I want the thing to use this information to go create a bar chart of a specific type. Whatever the options are. And then I wanted to create a pie chart like this. And I want to create a line graph like that. So in my application, I've got a bar chart, line graph, pie chart, other charts. I have built an abstraction, meaning a public surface or an interface, that works for me, for the domain. That domain doesn't have to use the full capability of that library. It just needs a very small subset. That abstraction gives me a simple way for my business application or the domain application to deal with my graphs and charts without getting all muddled and caught up in all of the possible, possible nuances that library has to offer. As a result, also gives me the opportunity to implement that class in a completely different way using a completely different third party library. Having different graphs appear. Yet, my abstraction, if it was a clean abstraction, would still hold because my requirement of that abstraction has not changed. All I've done is I've used a different third party library. Maybe it's better, maybe it's, you know, shinier, <laughs> whatever. What I'm getting at is a cleaner abstraction will last longer, if you will, right? A cleaner abstraction will last longer, not because it's too much of an abstraction or too little of an abstraction. It is the right level of abstraction. That abstraction was built for this domain to make use of a charting library from the perspective of the domain of your application, not from the perspective of the charting library. <laughs> but if your requirements have not changed, there's no need for that abstraction to change, which means you can implement it using various different libraries if you've abstracted correctly. Right? But nonetheless, even if you don't intend to change the library, the fact is you've given users of your, your, your abstraction a simple way to get bar charts and pie charts and all the different charts you want done and you're in some ways enforcing a certain shading or color theme or whatever that maybe you know you wouldn't do with the abstraction so that not every time you call a charting feature you have to remember to do all those things correctly right so in this case this the signature of this class the public surface or the interface would look like any other database related thing. You have no notion that it's a Cosmos DB thing. And that is how you need to design your abstractions. Yes, I'm working with Cosmos DB. If I look at the implementation here, you can see <laughs> there's lots of Cosmos DB things in here. They're all private only. It's the whole thing is just completely kind of cluttered with Cosmos DB stuff. This Cosmos DB client also, uh, another thing to point out here, oops, uh, is Show you some of the methods here. Create database, okay, that creates fine. Get container, very specific to Cosmos to get database. But then they've got other things like uh, get database stream async and so on. Or if you look at, um, well, these are specific containers. Yeah, even containers, for example, might have certain methods that may not make sense to you, like get item query iterator. What the heck is that? So the reason for this abstraction is saying, you know what, we have a need in our application to do these features or this functionality with Cosmos DB. Let's design the abstraction for that. I don't necessarily need to know or care to know, <laughs> more, more importantly, that is Cosmos DB. And who is going to understand these methods like get item query iterator, like get item link queryable. I mean, this is just too much nuance, too much detail about Cosmos DB. Yes, somebody needs to know that. Somebody who's building that interface, the implementation of this class needs to know that, sure. But nothing in your application needs to know that. Which is why you're building an abstraction. You're keeping a distance. You're decoupling yourself from the nuances of that library. Is it not? That's the main driver for an abstraction. And of course, that gives you the benefit of saying, well, I can have any implementation if your abstraction is at the right level. Like I'm proposing that this abstraction is. It doesn't matter. I could have this. In this case, of course, the implementation is using um, Cosmos DB, right? 
it may not make sense to you, but this is a Cosmos DB way of doing stuff. If I were to, let's say, retrieve, um, get tag videos, for example, there's a lot of gobbledygook, seemingly gobbledygook from a normal programming point of view. What the heck is going on here? But for those who know Cosmos DB, that would make sense. However, this method signature, I could implement using ADU.net if the data were in ADU.net. I could implement this method signature. Then given a signature like this, I could implement a method where the implementation was in memory or based on a file system or based on a database or based on blob store, whatever the, the case may be. It doesn't really matter. The abstraction, the method signature, the interface or the public surface of that class has is not leaking anything it's at that right level from the business point of view, from the domain perspective, it is at that right level of abstraction. I am trying to save data to some place. Here's my data. Please save it. I want you to get so-and-so data given an ID or a tag or a you know, series of tags. How you store that data? Is it in one table, two tables, 25 tables? <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to know. How Cosmos DB stores data versus how you have to store data in SQL Server? Completely different. But this abstraction is decoupling you from those implementations as well. What is your data model like? What is your database? Don't know. Don't care. <laughs> it's an abstraction from, in this case, a data storage point of view. What I'm saying from the business side, this abstraction is working for me. I am saying I want you to save my domain model, not what you have your table. I, I don't care what that table is or how many tables they are or if it's split up into 15 tables or it's in a Cosmos DB kind of container. I don't care. That video. And the tag video, these are my classes, domain classes. Right? This video type here and the tag video, these are my domain classes. These are not dependent on the database or the data model. I don't care whether I'm using SQL Server or Cosmos DB. My domain model is not going to change because my business is not changing. So the API, the abstraction, is based on what I need from the business's point of view. This class works for me. It talks in my language, my language meaning my types, right? The video uh, tag video and the video types. How, if this data is saved like this in, in the SQL Server database, database this way, or they're saved and it's split across multiple tables, I don't know. And I don't care. Is that data saved like this in Cosmos DB or has it got its own style? I don't care. I don't know what I don't want to know. That's the point of an abstraction. A good abstraction will give you that sense of saying, I don't need to know. I don't even want to know. And it's not leaking. It's not forcing me to learn about Cosmos DB or, or AD.NET EF, whatever you, know, you might be using. It's not a clean abstraction if it does that. So if it becomes a leaky abstraction. Or if it's too much of an abstraction, it becomes too vague and you're trying to be generic. Oh my gosh, I'm just going to store a thing. It's not a video. Just give me a thing and I'll store it. right? And I've seen uh, APS systems like that, CRUD operations. Oh, we've made this beautiful system. It's got all these CRUD operations. You know, and then you sometimes you send SQL statements as part of your arguments, which means you are leaking the abstraction. Two leaks are going. One is you are or could making it clear that the caller has to know SQL, which means now there you're forcing them to understand your language, right? <laughs> the database's language. But you're also leaking the this data model out to your system. Right now they the, how can they write a query if they want to sit and do an update if they don't understand your data model? So you're leaking all of that out. It's not just SQL. It's like so much is being given up, if you will, from an abstraction point of view. There are many services I've encountered, sometimes third-party services, sometimes within organizations, the company that I'm working with, where their abstractions of their services right, are pathetic. I mean, they're forcing you to understand their data model. Or because, let's say, they've got five tables, they've got five endpoints, and saying, well, you can do what you want. Yes, but... CRUD operations are not helping me one bit. CRUD operations don't help you as an API. Your API is helpful if it's providing some business value. So for example, if you're saying just, if I want to effect a certain change in my data, it's not a matter of just adding or updating one record. It may be that to do this one thing from a business point of view, I have to modify three tables, right? So give me CRUD operations for three tables is not the way you expose an API. You need to give me one method that says, and ask for the specific information that only I can give you. And 
you do all the stuff that needs to be done. If you have to modify three tables or 25 tables, that should be done by your system. Your API should not ask you ask the user to modify three or 25 tables. That's not what an API is. So as I said, a good method design implies, implies good class design, implies good system design. Focus on method design, meaning signatures of the methods, and class design, you will automatically design better APIs. So the same theory, the same ideas, levels of, of abstraction, decomposition, it all applies to everything else. Okay. So I think they, I'm hoping this class, the, or the, you know, the, the Cosmos DB gateway class, if you look at the methods, you know, I'm hoping that, that the public methods that helps you understand that this could be anything. It's not specific to a gateway or Cosmos DB. It could be anything. Which is why sometimes I feel like people get confused, right? So, but sure, but then what's the difference between a gateway and a facade? Yes, because all classes <laughs> are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to give you a clean level of abstraction. Like an abstraction is opaque. Opaque means you can't see, light can't go through it. It's like a black box. It's the point of an abstraction. You don't want to know. So classes are trying to be opaque, which is why if you hear my dependency injection kind of thing, I said, this is a black box. I don't want to know its dependency. That's the whole point of the class itself. A class has to be a black box. It has to, if it's a clean abstraction, it'll be a black box. I can't see through it. It does some really useful work for me. I don't know how it does it, and I don't care to know how it does it. So that abstraction is the point of every class. So then you're saying, well, then what's the difference between a gateway and, I don't know, um, the facade pattern? Well, there are similarities. They're both trying to do the same thing. They're both trying to give you this good abstraction. They're trying to be opaque. Their intents are slightly different. The motivations come from slightly different, different angles, and they are placed in the system at different places. The facade is like the front of your application or is the beginning of something, while a gateway is at the time of reaching out to our service. So depending on what it's doing in your system, it's a gateway. And of course, there are some nuances, some specializations, if you will. If you look at my videos on the gateway and the facade, they have very different implementation guidelines. But on the surface, that class is a class. It's giving you, it's useful because its abstractions are clean. And it's useful because you don't, you're not required to know the inner details or implementation details of that class. So that's the basic idea of abstractions. All right, I think this brings me to the end of this video. I hope I've done a good job of trying to explain abstractions. There are many forms of abstraction, but I was focused mainly on method and class abstractions. So I hope I've done a good job. If I have, please give me a thumbs up, and I will see you next time.